The German Western Offensive in 1940 is often misrepresented as, as a walk in the park for the Germans. Our song Resistant Bite proved that he wasn't. War is coming swiftly, the board is closing in. We're a company of soldiers, they're 40 rifles strong, all alone. It was called the Phony War, and I suppose with some good reason. Although France and Great Britain had declared war on Nazi Germany in September 1939, after Germany's invasion of Poland, they had not launched any real assaults in the field, even after seven months of inaction. And despite the German invasion of Denmark and Norway in April 1940, London and Paris still did not do so. Instead, they played for time, waiting for the Germans to one day run up against their defensive works. They gathered their strength. The old guard of generals and politicians thought this war would be like the last one. And since Germany lacked the economic reserves and the military apparatus to mirror their 1914 advance into Belgian and French territory, this one's outcome seemed already decided. But the Germans were well aware that with an enemy force ratio already stacked against them, they would ultimately lose any coming war of attrition. Instead, the German general staff agreed that only a forceful offense would see them victorious. General Leutnant Erich von Manstein and General Leutnant Heinz Guderian came up with a daring plan, one that no one would expect them, or anyone, to pull off, to drive a panzer division through the heavily wooded hills of the Ardennes. This would ultimately split the French forces and crash through them and the Belgians at their weakest spot. German panzers and motorized units would race to cross the River Meuse and force an operational exploitation through the Ardennes and even push through the first Belgian fortification lines at Martelange and further forward between Libramont and Neuf Chateau. For Belgian high command, the Ardennes were not a major defensive factor since the area is far in the southeast of the country and beyond the mighty river Meuse. Although there were several Belgian and French officers who spoke out against this defensive negligence, it was still generally agreed that an armored thrust through the Ardennes was simply impossible. Well, okay, not impossible, but tanks cannot go through the forest and must remain on the few roads. They would be sitting ducks, so the Germans would never do that. Instead, the Belgian military formed their defensive plans from their experiences in the Great War. They figured that, that spreading out their troops all along the border would see them overwhelmed by the stronger German advance. Also, the Belgian military endured several budget cuts in the interwar years and was unable to muster a large motorized or armored force. So they planned to concentrate the main mass of Belgian troops in redoubts in the northwestern part of the country and another force between Liège and Namur and wait for the Allies to come to their help. The Ardennes sector would only be lightly defended by the K groups under the command of General Maurice Kayart. Those groups consisted of a specialized screening force trained to move and fight in the heavily wooded forests. The Belgian Ardennes Light Infantry, Les Chasseurs Ardennais. Their primary mission was to act as, as a tripwire defense. They were not expected to stand up to the Germans since they were purely infantry without enough firepower to effectively stop armor. They were instead tasked to trigger demolition charges on, on bridges and on traffic routes. Upon receiving the order to withdraw, the Ardennes Light Infantry would disengage from the enemy and fall back to the main Belgian forces in the northwest of the country. For the Belgians to preserve as many as possible of their units until the Allied reinforcements arrived made sense. When looking back at Germany's 1914 Schlieffen plan, but now they played right into von Manstein's hands. And his plan was scheduled down to the minute. The crossing of the River Meuse had to be achieved in under four days, or the French would realize it was the main attack, and they'd bring in enough forces to collapse it like a house of cards. On May 10th, as the first German forces crossed the Luxembourg border and disarmed the surprised border guards, the clock began ticking.
Not even three hours later, the first reconnaissance units of the 1st German Panzer Division were rapidly pushing over the River Ur and were closing in on Martelange behind the Belgian border. Armored reconnaissance cars and motorcycle companies were putting the pedal to the metal, trying to secure bridges and traffic hubs. But when they reached the outskirts of Martelange, the bridges were already destroyed, and they came under small arms fire from nearby defenders, small groups of the Chasseurs Ardennais, firing from well-camouflaged positions. Scouting ahead, the Germans spotted fortified pillboxes, tank barriers, and other obstacles, aimed at delaying the main German force, while at least one powerful Belgian T-13, which would have made short work of the armored cars, was patrolling nearby. Hard pressed for every minute, and with little choice left, the German commander ordered the motorcycle companies to dismount and take the Belgian positions on a hill overlooking Martelange. Armed only with machine guns, the men charged in a suicidal frontal move across the slopes towards the Belgian defenders. But the Belgian light infantry was totally caught off guard and surrendered or withdrew without any chance of resistance. From Martelange onwards, the Germans pushed further to the west, through the valley of the Sauer River. That valley leads to the village of Boudange, at whose end a large hill rose, surrounded by the rivers Sauer and Basel, like, like the moat of a castle, right? And on that hill, Major Maurice Bricard, in command of the 5th Company of the Ardennes Light Infantry, was growing concerned. Reports were flooding in of fighting all through the Ardennes, but, but nothing was very specific. He had faith in his troops, who were veterans of the area and, like all chasseurs, knew how to fight with small unit tactics. Armed with modern 35-36 Mauser rifles and the Model 30 light machine gun, their marksmen could hold their own against just about any enemy troops. Looking down from the hill to the valley, they were also in a fairly good position to use their rifle grenades. They fought everywhere, shooting from behind trees and from on the move, trying to throw the Germans off their precious timetable. The first panzers were held up by the blown bridges and other barriers in Martelange, but the motorcycle companies moved forward down the valley towards Boudange. Spotting the Belgian defenses, they tried to repeat the same trick twice and rush the defenders by surprise, but without success this time. One of Bricart's combat patrols spotted the advancing Germans in the undergrowth, and after a quick exchange of surprised looks and cracking rifle shots, alarmed the others in the hills. Any further advance by the Germans was met with fierce resistance. Every time a field gray uniform was spotted, it was immediately pinned down with accurate rifle and machine gun fire. Bricart was on the phone, trying to reach his headquarters, asking for further orders. But no answer came. The line was dead. Cut by German paratroopers working in the Belgian rear. Hermann Goering, Luftwaffe commander and Germany's favorite medal collector, sought to speed up the breaking of the Belgian border defenses by sending in German soldiers by glider to attack the Belgian communication lines in the rear and spread chaos and confusion. Some had successfully landed near Virti and cut local telephone lines and blocked the main roads. No messenger could get through to Bricard. But according to plan, the Ardennes Light Infantry was retreating all along the border. Their headquarters in Neufchateau sent out orders to disengage immediately. Those orders did not reach Bricart. Unaware of what was going on in his rear, Bricart's 5th Company held on to their last order. Hold the border. True to their credo, resist et mort, they would resist and bite like the boars they were. All afternoon, the men of the 5th Company held out in their trenches and pillboxes, firing rifles and machine guns into the German attackers, who were forced to withdraw time and again. And the Belgian defenders were hitting the Germans where it hurt them the most. They were messing with their timetable. Shooting with extraordinary precision, they made the Germans pay dearly for every approach. But they didn't even have anything heavier than grenade launchers. The Germans realized that Boudange was impossible to take with infantry alone. 
The pioneers were frantically working on restoring the bridges and, and bringing in artillery. First, the 3.7 centimeter anti-tank guns and 7.5 centimeter light infantry guns fired on the Boudange positions, but were unable to penetrate the heavy Ardennes blockhouses, and the Belgians were just too well dug in. German radio operators called in heavier fire from a field howitzer battery from nearby Varnak. The shelling increased, and the shrapnel caused many bleeding wounds among the defenders, but still, they held. Only in the late afternoon, as four of the mighty 88 mm guns were unleashed against the hill, did the Belgian defenses crumble. Still, in bitter house-to-house -house fighting, the Belgians fought on until they were finally forced to surrender. Boudange was taken around 7 p.m., six hours after the first shots were exchanged. In truth, the heroic stand of the Chasseur Ardennes was not planned, nor was it even requested by high command. It was the result of a total communication breakdown caused by the German interference. And in a way, the German glider infantry attack had simply the opposite effect it was supposed to have. Had Brickhardt's men received the order to retreat, they would have disengaged long before the Germans could have reached Boudange. But the Chasseur had stood true to their orders and held the border as long as they could. Okay, so what inspired this? Because this is a bit unusual. It's uh, quite unusual and it's a story we rarely had heard anything about. I mean, yeah. it was uh, a fan actually in Belgium uh, who gave us the story in a Flemish document. Okay, and do you speak or read Flemish? Not a single word. Okay. <laughs> so it became a bit complicated and uh, the person translated it for us, like, sort of, uh, so that we could understand the story. Uh, but we could really never verify that it was absolutely true because we couldn't find any other alternative sources for this right. exactly thing. You know, I think it's kind of cool to write a song about a Belgian thing during war warfare because if there's one thing that I've learned from doing both the Great War and World War II is there's a lot of cool Belgian war stories, actually. There is, but they are usually older. That's true. That yeah. is true. But uh, there in, the, in the, the Great War, one of my favorite stories was the Belgian Armored Car Division. Uh -huh. ah. Now, the Belgian Armored Car Division did not fight in Belgium. Uh, now, when they were uh, invaded and stuff, these were volunteers that went to fight with Russia on the Eastern okay. Front in like 1914, 15, 16. And now they were, Belgium was still neutral. You know, we think of it, oh, they fought with the Allies. They didn't. Belgium was, it was, even though they were overrun and being defended by the Allies, it was still neutral. But these guys, the Belgian Armored Car Division, which is a bad name for a band still. <laughs> but they fought, they fought with the Russians, and there was an Olympic cyclist, um, a four-time world boxing champion, was one of the Belgian Armored Car Division things. Thing is, after the revolution and stuff, they got stranded on the Eastern Front. They couldn't, they couldn't go to the West because they were still enemies in the World War. And, of course, then now there's the Bolsheviks, and then the Russian Civil War started. So they had to go all the way around the world to get back to Belgium. After wow. oh, you should look them up. Yeah. Hey, and somebody out there, write a song about the Belgian <laughs> Armored Car Division. <laughs> yeah, we we have so we have a lot of fans in Belgium. Uh, I mean, we we considered Belgium our second home for a while. Yeah, uh, it was the, probably the place outside of Sweden where it really took off, and we really had an established fan base that was coming very early. Okay, uh, we were really lucky. We played a festival there called Grass Pop. Okay, um, the first year, first time we ever played a big festival, but we were playing inside of a tent and nobody heard about us. So nobody should really go to the concert, actually. However, a horrible uh, thunderstorm came, uh, well, which you. basically evacuated the entire festival and sent them into the tent just as we were supposed to play. So instead of playing for an empty tent, we yeah. played for absolutely packed tent and people were like, whoa, this band is actually really good. And it led us to the, the next year. We were upgraded to the main stage of the same festival. Wow. And... Uh, since then, uh, the relationship Sabaton and Belgium has steadily always been very, very solid. So a lot of Belgians over the years have also asked us to write songs about their history and stuff. And uh, this one we found from World War II, which was a little bit like unexpected yeah. of all the stories from Belgium to say. Yeah. 
No, but that's, 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 that's great. I had no idea that you had such a connection with, with Belgium. So, so wait, what year was this when, and with, the, with the festival, the first year that you The played? first year we played the festival was in 2007. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. This was before like things with 40 to 1 took off and stuff. Exactly. Stuff like okay. We didn't go outside Sweden until 2005. Right. We didn't start to tour outside of Sweden. And we had visited Belgium once before, but once we had this opportunity to play on a festival, it was really changing something for us. Well, that's really cool. Well, and thank you, Belgium, for that. Oh, and how about this? If you have any great Belgian military history stories, you know where to write them, right? It could come up on here. Some future Sabaton albums. Maybe there's a whole album called Belgia. <laughs> and it's only war stories of, of Belgian. Yeah, you know, not saying no, right? No, not saying no at all. Okay, you get enough stories, maybe you'll do it. All right, well, I think that's about it for us for today, yeah? That's it for today. Thank you, everybody, for watching. See you next time on Sabaton History. Thank you everybody for supporting us and watching these episodes every week. But we need a lot of more of you to support us. So become a subscriber of the channel and become a Patreon because we really need your support to continue to do this every week so we can see each other every week, right? Thank you very much.